Well, welcome to this edition of Conversations on Church Innovation. My name is Tim Nations. I'm with Leadership Network, and joining me here today is Kevin Penry, uh, Operations Director for LifeChurch.tv out of Oklahoma City. And uh, Life Church has been a participant in several of leadership communities uh, at Leadership Network on multi-site and also our Global Connections Leadership Community on Missions over the past several years. Uh, today, we're going to be talking with Kevin about multi-site and what Life Church is doing, what they have learned over the last 12 or 13 years of being a multi-site church. So, Kevin, again, thank you for joining me here. Welcome. Well, thank you, Tim. I really appreciate getting to be included in anything that Leadership Network does. Uh, Leadership Network has been a tremendous platform for us over the last 13 or 14 years as this process has unfolded. And just uh, uh, it, it makes me happy to know that uh, what was probably in Bob Buford's heart so many years ago is actually unfolding on a daily basis uh, through, through everything that you guys are doing. It certainly has impacted um, uh, the path that we've been able to travel. I want to thank you guys for, for providing what you provide. Absolutely. I'm glad to have you here with yeah. us today. You know, Kevin, I think most people probably know something about Life Church, uh, are familiar with Pastor Craig Rochelle, but let's assume that they don't. And so tell us a little bit first, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, tell us a little okay. about Life Church and your role on the directional leadership team. Okay. Uh, well, again, my name is Kevin Penry. Uh, I've been at Life Church now for 15 years. Uh, came out of the marketplace as uh, four of our five directional leaders have come. Our senior pastor is Craig Rochelle, who you mentioned. Uh, Craig's the only one with uh, an MDiv. Uh, the rest of us come out of a very non-traditional path into a church environment, and I think that has uh, served uh, God's purpose for what he's done here at Life Church. Uh, Craig uh, always talks about uh, the example in the scripture where uh, those that were observing Jesus and his disciples uh, determined that they were ignorant and unlearned, and uh, they were just uh, some idiotes, I think was the, was the, the, the word that was used, idiotes, who, uh, idiots who had been with Jesus. And so I'm just another one of those idiots that have been with Jesus, and God's uh, uh, given me the opportunity to, to enjoy some amazing all right. Uh, I've had the opportunity to be on the leadership team here at Life Church for 15 years. Um, been able to be the one that focuses on operations. Uh, my history, being architecture, commercial pilot, I'm kind of geared towards structure, uh, maybe data visualization, and certainly the, the background in real estate really helps me. So all the construction and, and design and uh, buildings, finance, uh, let's see, what else? Small groups, missions. Uh, that type, uh, that side of the organization is basically what I'm responsible for. So I'm really enjoying it. Get to uh, bring a little bit of strategic thought to the picture and uh, then just enjoy being surprised by what, uh, what God continues to do. Well, uh, Kevin, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, our, our show today is going to focus on multi-site. So talk with us a little bit about what that looks like at Life Church. Uh, Life Church was unusual, and uh, about 2000, uh, we became one church in two locations in January of 2001. Uh, it was soon thereafter, and we were starting. It, it was kind of born out of constraint for us. We were uh, we were growing. We were the building was full. Well, we weren't able to uh, get the financing that we need to build what we needed to build, and we had another church that uh, wanted to become a part of what God was doing at Life Church. So that gave us the opportunity to become one church in two locations. Through the constraints that we were facing, we had already explored uh, some theater sites and uh, had been having some experiences uh, up the road in a theater. So we really had the concept of, uh, of what could, of what we felt like that could be explored as far as multi-site and video teaching. In 2000, 2001, it was still pretty early as regard to video teaching. There were a handful of people doing it across the country. Uh, for site number three, we, we really wanted to find out just what that uh, was capable of. So we, we launched our first video campus about 100 miles up the road uh, for site number three. And we learned that, uh, that, it, that it worked, uh, that, that uh, it was functioning and, and things went well. So in 2003, we had pretty much determined that we wanted to be a multi-site church, that God was calling us to be a multi-site church, not just a church that did multi-site. And we took a pretty bold move, and this uh, came out of our first uh, experience with Leadership Network. We were part of Group One uh, uh, in the multi-site uh, environment that you guys uh, started in, in 2000. And um, 
we just blew up our organization. Uh, we, we were young enough and early enough in our development that we said, uh, how would, if we were going to go about just doing, uh, being a multi-site church, how should we be organized? We saw two distinct paradigms beginning to emerge. There was the paradigm of being uh, on a campus, a campus team, being the advocate and the champion for that campus and being connected with all the things that occurred there. And we realized that there was another paradigm that was emerging and in, in being able to resource and equip those, those campuses. Um, so early on, we never uh, started with the burden. I'll use that term burden because uh, uh, it's, it's a bit of a juxtapositioning, but uh, of a large uh, main site, main location. We started off uh, and have held true to uh, the concept that all of, our, all of our campus locations will have parity. And uh, so we created a central support team in 2003, September 2003. We totally reorganized. And uh, that reorganization, I think, has served as well. Uh, we're presently at uh, 18 campuses. We've got four more coming out of the ground now. Uh, we're launching at the rate of about three to four campuses per year. Uh, so out of those current 18 campuses, we're experiencing a weekend attendance uh, somewhere between 50 and 60,000 physical people in seats. Uh, we're in five states, uh, soon to be six, and uh, it's, it's, it's going very well. We're able to, to really reap the benefits of having uh, reorganized the way we did in 2003. Well, Kevin, uh, you know, there, are, as you know, there are a lot of different models for multi-site out there. I've heard it said recently that when you've seen one multi-site church, you've seen one multi-site church. And so uh, what are some of the whys, the reasons behind mm. the path that you guys have followed? Mm. Well, I touched on it briefly and talking about the two paradigms that had emerged. Uh, as a leadership team, uh, like uh, I went to our first distant campus. I, I modeled the, the role of campus pastor first, and then we went, uh, when we went 100 miles up the road, uh, I and Bobby Grunwald went and began to, to experience firsthand what that, uh, that looked like. And it was through those experiences that the reorganization concept emerged. Uh, I was empowered in every way that I could be. Uh, I was a decision maker. I had all the authority that, that the organization could grant me. To, uh, to empower me to make the right decisions, to, to make the right moves for the campus. And it became very clear that if to those people who had never been to that campus 100 miles away, it still was not uh, important enough to them. Uh, I felt uh, you know, some of the, the core values that we had for excellence were easily compromised if it was for a site that a person who was preparing those resources had never been to. And that's, that began to drive this this understanding of we needed a, a team, a central support team that was dedicated to producing quality resources independent of their geographical location. So we reorganized on that with the commitment to producing resources that were going to be of the highest quality and would work no matter what your geographical location. Um, Craig, as a speaker, began to model early on uh, his communication was along the same lines. He had to he, uh, he didn't have to stop using local references. He just had to uh, explain local references. And in the explanation of a local reference, it just reminded the people on the receiving end, okay, Craig remembers that I'm here. Uh, too many times uh, early on, I've, I've seen speakers that would begin with a, a local reference and never reconcile it to those who may not understand it or who might be uh, at a greater distance from where they're hearing it. If you just pause and begin to, to, to describe why you're using that local reference and what it means, it sends the signal that I remember, I know you're there. But those learnings came out of that division in the organization. And so uh, the, reasons, the reason why we reorganized was to uh, lend credibility to those two different perspectives and reinforce the support role. We call it central support, not central control. And this, this group of people that are here to supply the resources that campuses need in an effective way and it's uh, it served uh, served us very well. I should say before that, though, uh, to remember that I, I believe where multi site is working best is where it's it's uh, it's born out of constraint. It's uh, the people that are uh, doing multi site and doing it well and experiencing a, a, a great return are not doing it just because it's cool or it's uh, the the newest and best thing or because it's something that they want to experience. 
They're doing it because it was the only way uh, to reach more people. Uh, they had reached the end of their ability to, uh, to accommodate uh, folks that were trying to, to come to where they were at. And so uh, that was the other reason is, is the constraints that we were faced with forced us uh, to, to figure out how we were going to get the message uh, of the gospel uh, before more people. So those are, uh, uh, those are the reasons why, uh, some of the primary reasons why we've, uh, we've followed the path that we're on, and it's, it's, uh, it's served a good outcome. Well, you mentioned the constraint as kind of a launching point for you guys, and you've also mentioned a couple of other key steps along the way for you in your multi-site journey. Uh, what are some other uh, maybe experiences, maybe some learnings, positive or negative, that have shaped and influenced where you are today? Some mistakes. Yeah, uh, yeah. Good, good things and bad things. Uh, I'm always, whenever we're interviewing a new team member, I'm always interested in their failure resume because uh, if they if they don't have a failure resume, then I know they're getting ready to make some big mistakes, and uh, it would be great to know that. So we we certainly have a failure resume. Uh, I keep I've mentioned our reorganization. Certainly a positive thing when we reorganized in 2003. That was definitely a positive milestone. We could not be where we were at, uh, where we are at today, had we not uh, taken that step. Um, something that might appear foolish and as a mistake to us in retrospect, I think on second look has really served us very well. We, uh, through uh, to some extent, by by not knowing what couldn't couldn't be done. Uh, we set out with a pretty bold initiative very early on. Probably, we reorganized in 2003. Probably as early as 2005, we launched an initiative called uh, 50 and 5. And we, uh, we believed that, um, that we were called to launch 50 campuses over the next five years. And about two years into that, it became apparent that we uh, had kind of over, overshot our goal. But here's what it did. It gave us a season to where we challenged every question and every decision that we made through the filter of could we do this if we were, if we were doing 50 locations. And it, uh, what it did is it brought focus and refinement to, uh, to the decisions that we made, to how we operated, to the way we scaled, the people we hired, the logistics aspects of the way we, we went about organizing uh, our ministries. And uh, I've had so many people as we've grown through the years, uh, uh, you know, uh, from five to 10 to 15 now to 20 campuses, oftentimes people will ask us, uh, what, were the, what were the big challenges moving from uh, five to 10 or from 10 to 15 or 15 to 20? And what I'll say is I think because of that somewhat uh, foolish, uh, maybe too bold of initiative of thinking we were going to do 50 campuses in five years. We laid a groundwork and an infrastructure that has allowed us to continue to expand uh, in an unrestricted way. It's just uh, the, 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 the things that we put in place as far back as 2005 continue to be the, the, uh, the organizational structure and the elements that we, we utilize today. Certainly there, there have been some changes and some tweaks along the way, but for the most part, everything about our organization was determined during those formable years when we were trying to figure out how we were going to accomplish 50 campuses in five years. Now, uh, I mentioned mistakes. We, uh, we really took a bold move uh, in the earliest stage of that in 2005, and we went as far as we could go to a place that we were unknown and stretched ourselves beyond our ability to, uh, to deliver. And I uh, feel like we got some of the answers from God that we were ultimately seeking when we, uh, we set out to launch two campuses simultaneously in Phoenix, about 1,100 miles away from us. This was in 2005. Uh, we made a lot of mistakes. Uh, we learned a lot of the reasons why we do what we do today. Uh, and uh, we were not uh, successful in those two launches in Phoenix in 2005. That uh, really taught us a lot. We had some learnings. Uh, our questions were centered around how could we launch at a critical mass 
uh, in some way other than the three to five year building curve that seemed to be necessary in order for us to achieve that. We, could we come in with adequate marketing? Could we come in with a substantial enough experience? Could we transfer enough people in? Could we, could we enculturate a group of people in a, more, in a more rapid form to allow us to launch a campus in, say, six months that, that open the doors with, with uh, 12, 1,500 people uh, in a place that pre, uh, prior to they had not known who Life Church was. And uh, in our efforts to do that, we learned that uh, we were uh, circumnavigating the very processes that was forming the core of who we were. And uh, I use the analogy sometimes that when uh, they, those early days of that attempt, people uh, would come to our campus and it probably looked a little bit like an eight, 18 month old baby wearing an Armani suit. You know, it was, uh, uh, things weren't right. It was like something doesn't fit here. Uh, we were executing with excellence. Uh, we had lots of bells and whistles. We had uh, lots of people dedicated to an outcome, uh, but we had probably, uh, unintentionally circumnavigated the very processes that form our DNA of who we are as a church. And uh, we had to back up and, uh, and be more patient and allow for, um, uh, for our campuses to, to grow into self-sustaining campuses. And it took some patience over the next three to four years. Uh, but we, we've, we've seen that happen now and we're, we're afforded a timeline that, allows for campuses over the course of, if we're in a new area where we've not been known, uh, it might take three, four, or five years for that campus to really get on its feet in a strong way. In uh, communities where we are known, where people know who Life Church is, uh, we can launch uh, with the doors open in a, in a very viable fashion. Uh, sometimes launching with as many as, as 1,500, 2,000 people uh, at a new site, and new location. So there's been a lot of learning. Uh, the reorganizations at the foundation uh, structuring and uh, putting the logistics together to scale uh, has served us very well. Well, you know, it's easy to look from the outside if you're just looking at uh, numbers, the number of campuses, and uh, think of that in terms of success for Life Church. Mm -hmm. But yeah. uh, I know that it's more than that for you guys. So, how do you measure yeah. progress? How do you measure mm -hmm. success as a church? Well, we're you, those who know us, know that we're a high feedback organization. So we're continually surrounding ourselves with, uh, with outcomes. Um, I'm, I'm a big data, data visualization person, so I, I, I really love charts and graphs. I uh, believe that they will be on the other side of this life, that in heaven there are <laughs> charts and graphs. And uh, uh, so we're continually trying to, to evaluate uh, the outcomes certainly uh, is attendance working. You know, if, if, if attendance isn't growing, if people aren't coming in the doors, we can't, we can't go to the next step. If uh, in order for you to be a part of introducing an individual to Christ and then uh, furthering their development uh, for the most part, they, they've got to make it through the church doors. So you got to figure out, is that happening? And if it's not, you got to figure out why we've seen our attendance grow steadily um, doubling about every three years. Um, if once they are attend, uh, if they're attending, if they're not connecting, if they're not serving, if they're not getting in community with others through a small group, if they're not becoming engaged with their giving, uh, they're not going to stay. It's not going to last. And the church isn't going to grow. Uh, we're fortunate in that we're seeing good, solid performance from all of those things. Uh, we've got about uh, the last uh, uh, look that I made. We've got about 65 percent of our average weekend attendance engaged in small groups. Now, that doesn't mean 65% of the people who call Life Church their church are in a small group because we know everybody doesn't attend every weekend. But just as a rule of thumb, and we're, we're trying to get to that, that number where our, the number of people in small groups is equal to the number of people that are attending on, a, on an average week, uh, knowing that still then there's many people who may not be fully connected because there's so many people that don't come every week. Uh, but we're measuring there. Certainly the number of people that it takes for us to uh, operate 15, 20 campuses is big, so we, we've got lots of opportunity for people to, um, uh, to serve. And our, uh, we've just been blessed beyond measure as far as financial engagement. Um, you know, there, there's so many uh, aspects that are different 
uh, in, an, in a multi-site environment that's fast growing and dynamically changing. You got to figure out how do, uh, how do people come on board and financially supportive of, of what's going on there and how do they stay engaged and connected. And God is really, uh, has really blessed us and uh, uh, to the point now that we're seeing uh, the ability to, to launch those three or four campuses a year out of the margin uh, that's left over, over and above our operating. A portion of that's attributable to the efficiency of the, mar- of the uh, operating model. Our operating costs have not risen significantly uh, relative to our attendance uh, increase and our, uh, and our revenue streams. So it's, uh, it's, 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 it's going very well. And, um, you know, we don't want to fail to, to recognize that it's God's and he's doing it and, uh, he could pull the plug on it tomorrow. Uh, we just, we don't have any, any signs or indications of bumps in the road or, uh, or, or, or troubles at this point. And, uh, uh, we just look forward to God continued to allow us to learn what he would stand ready to teach us. He's doing more than we could ask, think, or imagine. And it's, uh, it's, really, it's really hard to comprehend. That's good, Kevin. Uh, you know, you have shared your experience and learnings with several teams and leaders that have been a part of our groups and, and also uh, leaders and teams in multi-site and other places. What are uh, a couple of key things that you would share with other leaders that are either exploring multi-site or that are just early in the process of being a multi-site church? Uh, okay. So are we talking about uh, things to do resources or what you be, uh, can you be more specific? Uh, we'll get to some recommendations on resources here in just a little bit, but if you were uh, just looking at things for them to be thinking through and considering uh, mm-hmm. as a multi-site church. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, You've heard me mention it uh, in, in my conversation here with you uh, at, this, at this time. Uh, I, would, I would recognize that constraints can be a contributor to your innovation. Um, uh, realize that, that sometimes things that appear to be barriers are, um, may not always be there to be broken down or to be climbed over, but they could be a directional indicator. They could be something uh, that God is, uh, is using Uh, to cause you to ask the question, what have we not learned yet? What else do we need to get in place? If we, if we truly believe, uh, and and I know we do, uh, but, but if, 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 if we, if we truly believe that God is as passionate, certainly more passionate than we are for the loss that we're trying to reach, uh, does he not stand ready with all the resources that we would need in order to, to do what we need to do? And the answer is, of course, he does. He he has those he has those resources, and he can release them. If if for any reason he's not releasing a resource, or there's an obstacle in my way that he's not removing, my question immediately goes to why? What is it that I'm not seeing? What it, what questions have I not asked? What alternatives have have I not explored? All the ways that we are doing church today was the result of us simply being told no by all the lenders that we approached for our efforts to expand. Had we been able to build the building we wanted to build at that time, and we felt like we needed, we would not have gone multi-site. And uh, I don't know how many times then that God will use constraints or stands ready to use those constraints as a directing method for us. And so uh, I would say do that. I I wouldn't say uh, when, when you find constraints or obstacles, Certainly don't cave in. Don't, don't put it into neutral and just stop and say, I'm not going to do anything anymore. But use it to prompt the questions and explore what, what are we not asking? What are we not doing? What do we need to do differently? Uh, what do we need to stop doing? Uh, what new thing do we need to consider that we've not, that we've not brought in? So, so utilize, utilize those constraints and see those constraints as, as a way that God would use, you, uh, use to, to help you discover uh, what he stands ready to do. I think I, w- I would uh, I would also say that, uh, and Craig Craig has expressed this many times. We have a tendency as church leaders to probably overestimate what uh, God stands ready to do in the short term, and underestimate what He's going to do in the long term. Mm-hmm. And um, 
I don't think that means we should be any less enthusiastic or lower our expectations uh, for what's going to happen tomorrow or next, next week or next month or even this year. But uh, we cannot comprehend how far God will take us if we'll just allow him to shape our direction and hear what he has to say and refine our actions. And uh, I believe that's what we're experiencing uh, today is we've, we've been blessed with an environment where we are, it's a safe place uh, to explore. In many ways, you've heard me describe life church as a, as a safe place to fail. It's not a safe place to make the same mistake over and over, but it's a safe place to try something that hasn't been tried before, to ask a question that maybe hasn't been asked, and to see what God might do. Um, and then we take the outcome, we evaluate it, we adjust, and we take a next step. And I think uh, God has, uh, has honored that, and it's been, a, it's been a, a, a fertile field of God developing us and uh, helping us to, to explore and discover new things. The next thing, by, by the four of us that are sitting with Craig on the directional leadership team being out of the marketplace, we didn't know what couldn't be done. So we, you know, had we had all the appropriate traditional training, uh, we might not have attempted uh, or even thought further about the things that we did. Uh, but but we didn't know what couldn't be done, and so we, uh, you know, we we embraced technology at a time where many people had questions. We uh, we we embraced video as a potential to share the gospel in a real fashion. Uh, we embraced uh, the smartphone as a way to engage people into scripture. Uh, it just, the list goes on and on. And uh, so I would just, I would encourage all the churches uh, to, uh, to create safe environments to ask the hard questions and, uh, and then watch closely and listen for what, how God responds and then adjust and take a next step. Well, let's move on to resources then. As you think about um, some books, some hmm. other resources, uh, per perhaps some experiences that have shaped you as a leader or have helped to shape your church, um, what yeah. are some things that you might recommend? Well, you know, I've already spoken highly of, of Leadership Network, and I'm, I'm not, uh, I say that from my heart. Uh, every other resource I'm going to mention to you here. Uh, was born out of the environment that Leadership Network provided for us. We were, uh, this sounds foolish at this point, but in, in 99 and 2000, when we were thinking about multi-site, we assumed uh, that nobody else was having such a conversation. Uh, uh, we were just foolish enough and disconnected enough from a network of churches and, and peers that uh, we thought the conversations we were having uh, were unique and they were occurring nowhere else. And only through uh, Leadership Network and their efforts to find people experiencing similar things and develop communities so that they can share those experiences were we able to do just that. And we were invited, uh, uh, Craig and I were flying on 9-11, we were in the air whenever uh, uh, the tragic events occurred uh, on 9-11, and we didn't make it to our destination. We were, we, had, uh, we, we were one of the folks across the country that when the planes were put down on the ground, we were, you know, I, I found it looked like trains, planes, and automobiles when I found myself walking uh, across uh, the St. Louis airport uh, to try to figure out uh, how to get back to Oklahoma. Uh, because you don't realize how big airports are until you until you set out to, to hike across uh, across one. But uh, I'll never forget 9/11 because for me it was Craig and I on our way to share our story for the first time with a group of other churches, uh, all via Leadership Network. Uh, so we didn't make it that trip, but the next quarter we were at our we were at our meeting, and that's when it began to unfold. And uh, we found that there were other groups that. Uh, God was doing the same thing with and posing the same questions and creating the same conversations. And we were able to work together and share and network those things and, and learn from one another's experiences 
out of such an experience, I was introduced to uh, several authors, one of which was uh, uh, Pat Lin Lincioni. And in 2003, one of his early trilogy of books, I think there's five dysfunctions of a team and there's the four obsessions of an extraordinary executive, I think. And then there was one other, but that book, the four obsessions of an extraordinary executive. Uh, and you can check that title. I may, I may have a word wrong in there, but uh, that served us in a profound way to gain organizational clarity. Uh, he's, he's rewritten it in the form of the advantage today. So if you can't find four obsessions, uh, his, his more recent book, the advantage will, will help you in the same way. It just will serve you so well to allow your organization to come face to face with uh, who it is. And if, uh, uh, you know, it's the beginning place to try to recognize how God has shaped, has shaped you. And, uh, and then understand where, where it is uh, you want to go. Um, uh, you know, and uh, I still, I, I don't find myself going back to it as much as I did, but anybody who has an experience, uh, Jim Collins, good to great, I would encourage them to. Again, it's just a, it's a great platform for refining an organization's understanding of who they are, what they're passionate about, and what they do well. And uh, that served us, served us very well. So those are the milestones of uh, resources that I would put out there. All right. So uh, what is a question that mm. you feel like I should have asked uh, that mm. I didn't? Mm. And how would you answer? Oh, I don't know if you should have asked it or not. I, uh, uh, those who have been around me have heard it a lot. I, I feel like as I, as I tell this story, and I find myself telling the story over and over, and God blesses me. Every time I tell it, I hear something uh, maybe a little more clearly, or I understand something uh, in a way that uh, a little more fully than I did before. And I can, I can really begin to, to kind of piece things together in such a way that you can only do in a retrospect. And, and I understand that all the things that we enjoy today, Life Church enjoys, being understood that it's God's work. Uh, but it's all built on a foundation of, uh, that allows for self-awareness. And you've heard me say this before. You know, self-awareness is the platform for all development. It's, um, we can't come to Christ until we become self-aware that we're a sinner in need of a Savior. Uh, any of us that are in pastoral work or uh, counseling with others, you can recognize if you're sitting across the table from somebody that you know needs help and they say they truly desire to get to a destination, just like all of us and all of our teams may be that are trying to figure out how to, how to uh, spread the gospel. If you're sitting across the table from somebody that says they really want to get to a destination, but you find out that they are really not aware of who they are and what their problems are, as well as what their strengths are. And they might be living in a bit of a misconception. You know, and it looks a little bit like a bad American Idol audition. You know, it could look like a struggling uh, married couple uh, that, that uh, one or both parties are unwilling to admit what their challenges are. You reach a point and you just say, you know what, I, I, I can't do anything else here until something changes. Uh, you know, uh, I've gone as far as I can go. There's got to be something that clicks. The, in, in, the, in the prodigal son story, that, that, that moment is whenever uh, the, the, the son uh, came to his senses and he turned. You know, he realized in my father's house, there are servants that are living better than I have. But you see... Any effort to try to communicate that, I'm sure that that fact didn't change on that day. It was his awareness that changed. And until he, was, until he had that self-awareness, nothing, nothing could happen. The father could not do a thing. The father could not constrain him to come back, could not bless him with all the things that he stood ready to give him until that son became self-aware of, of that fact. And that is continues to be true to us today as church leaders and as church organizations. And I believe the prerequisite for the Holy Spirit to be able to do what he stands ready to do, and it's beyond what we could ask, think, or imagine, the prerequisite for that 
is to be willing to become self-aware as church leaders, as a staff, as members of a staff, and as an organization. In order for us to become self-aware, we have to be in a place that's uh, safe for that to happen. We have to be in a place that it's safe to become vulnerable. We have to be in a place that it's, uh, it's safe to make a mistake. Again, not make the same mistake over and over, but we got to be willing and we got to be able to, to embrace one of those, of those things. And I believe that's the prerequisite that was in place at Life Church. I think Craig modeled that. He was, he was young when he established Life Church. He was 28 years old. Uh, when I came on board, I was the old man. You know, I was uh, 45 whenever he was 30. And, uh, uh, you know, he, uh, he asked, you know. And, 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 and whenever, whenever he's preparing a message, he would, he would communicate with so many people on the staff and get their feedback. After he comes out of a message, first time on the weekend, he wants to know from uh, the, those of us that are closest to him, what could I do better? You know, uh, what, how, how can it be better? He, he modeled that feedback and that vulnerability and that, that desire for self-awareness. And so that just, that cascaded through our organization. And over the years, we've learned how to bring that to the table in our new hires and in the information that, that we surround ourselves with. And I would just encourage any and all churches and organizations to recognize um, the payback for that, that vulnerability is tremendous. If we truly want to see all that God would stand ready to do, um, we need to be willing to hear all that he would have to say to us. And uh, that makes for uh, uh, a vulnerable environment that, um, that he can use in such a way uh, that uh, will surpass everything we can imagine. So I'm not saying you should ask that uh, or that you overlooked it, but I believe it's the foundation for everything that we've been able to experience and enjoy uh, through God's, through God's goodness. That's good. Kevin, thank you for sharing that. And, mm -hmm. and kind of as we wrap up today, is there anything that you would like to, to plug anything that you guys are doing <laughs> that you're connected with that you want to promote? This is your chance. Uh, you know, I don't, I, I don't, uh, I don't have anything, anything special. I, uh, uh, we're just loving seeing what God's doing. And, um, and, and so happy to see it happening in so many other places. And we know that God is at work. Just as whenever we started in 2000, uh, we discovered that, you know what, we're not unique. Uh, uh, you know, God is, this is a movement. God is, uh, God loves the, loves the world uh, more than we do. And he's, uh, he's at work uh, trying to, uh, to share his son with them. And we're, uh, we're overjoyed to get to be a part of it. And so uh, thanks for, for allowing us to be a part of it in, in your world. Oh, absolutely. Uh, well, Kevin, thank you again for your time today. And uh, for those of you that are watching this video, if you would like any more information about Multisite or about the uh, opportunities and programs that Leadership Network has related to the topic of Multisite, feel free to reach out to me at my email, tim.nations at leadnet.org. And we'll be glad to get you more information on that. Uh, you know, at Leadership Network, we uh, like to say that we foster innovation movements that activate the church to greater impact. And so our challenge to you today is to take these ideas and to allow them to move you to greater impact. God bless.